Hello guys and welcome to the Film Culture Podcast Episode 3. My name is Declan and I'm here with... Hello, this is James. Happy to be here. Now James, this is a pretty... I don't know. It wasn't that much of a news week this week, but we still got some news. Yeah, we got, we got the news. Also, some great films came out this week, like God's Not Dead 2, coming out coming to to below a three on IMDb, along with Meet the Blacks, which is still not up on Rotten Tomatoes. <laughs> yeah, phenomenal movies. Yes. Let's get into the news. In an interview released by Empire Magazine. Kingsman the Secret Service director Matthew Vaughn revealed that the subtitle for the sequel will be The Golden Circle. Along with that and the images that were released, what do you think the uh, the title reveals about the upcoming film? Um, to be 100% honest, I have no clue. I did not read any of the comic books at all. So I have no clue, to be 100% honest. I'm, <laughs> only thing I know is I'm excited, because the first Kingsman was beyond great. Totally agree with you there, but have you seen the pictures? I have not seen the pictures. Okay, the only one that I really remember standing out to me is at the American headquarters. Okay. Headed by Halle Berry, I believe, mm. is an old uh, alcohol factory. Oh. Yeah, there's a, I think it's a bottle of whiskey as the uh, the main figure. And then, like, uh, Congress buildings on the side. Congress-like, I don't know. Mm. Wow. I think we have them talking about the Golden Circle being something in relation to like um the secret services of the world mm-hmm. getting together to fight a, a universal threat. But yeah, oh. I haven't read the comic either, so it's purely speculation on my part and what I've heard from other people. Is Matthew Vaughn coming back to direct this one? Yes, he is. Okay, good. Because he always makes great films and then he doesn't direct the sequels and the sequels are horrible. I think uh, he didn't direct uh, Days of Future Past, did he? No, but that one was okay because it was directed by um, uh, Brian Singer. Yes. Yeah, that did the original ones. But there's a a lot of his films. Are, I'm trying to think of the other one. There's one that I'm like spacer right now, but it was really good, and the sequel was terrible. I remember reading a while ago that he, I don't know, he, has a, he definitely has a history of that. A few other, yeah. a few other directors too, like um, I, know, I think Scorsese had a few mm-hmm. um, sequels that were below average that he didn't touch. Yeah, I Let's want see. it has Nicolas Cage in it. I can't. It's on the tip of my tongue. Let's see, directing he has Layer Cake, Startup, Kickass. <laughs> That's it. That was it. Kickass is the only one that had a sequel. So yeah. And not, that not sequel was terrible. Stuff. But he also was a producer on Fanta- on Fan Four Stick, so can't do all good. <laughs> you know what I found out? I was watching Scooby Doo Two. I'm so sorry. I like it. It's a good reminder of my childhood. <laughs> that wasn't that long ago. <laughs> but I was watching it, and the writing credit is James Gunn. Yeah. And I was super surprised to find that out. Maybe that's why you love it. Yeah, that, I I guess so. Because I do like the con. I, I don't really like the like. I was watching it like as a kid. I always thought that opening scene of like going through the town and the things, out uh, in, in the alleys and stuff like that. I thought that was real. And I was watching it this week, and I was like, oh, that's clearly CGI. I, I don't have fun, the fondest memories of that. I did know the video games though; those were fun. Yeah. I remember liking the concept of the second one, but yeah, it was. I was surprised to find that out. Anyway, so what's our next piece of news? Due to scheduling conflicts with, with director Doug Liman's upcoming movie, The Wall, for Amazon Studios, Channing Tatum's Gambit movie has been delayed once again. What kind of effect do you think this will have on the movie overall? Um, I think it's going to have some major effects. Um, I was really surprised because I thought there was going to be a lot of films that came out, a lot of like Fox's X Men films that came out, um, but I was really surprised when that happened because wasn't that supposed to come out like this year, but then it got delayed back. Yes, somehow they they were supposed to start production th- uh, this summer, 
and have it in theaters by October, I think. Mm-hmm. So that's it's already clunky. Mm-hmm. But again, you also have to follow up Deadpool's success. Both of them were passion project for the stars. Yeah. And it had, it had a lot of hype to live up to, so they're probably waiting for just the right moment to have everything set up for a great movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, well, big news, by the way, James. I don't mm-hmm. know if you saw this. I have you saw Deadpool? Dead, uh, yeah, I saw Deadpool this weekend. D- did it live up to the hype for you? Um, I don't think it lived up to the hype. It lived up to my own personal expectations. But, unfortunately, I feel like the whole month or two absence of me not seeing it really hurt. Because... Probably did, because it had everyone else to, like, say, oh, it's great, one of the greatest comic book films of all time, and you just walk in, it's like, it was funny. It, but... it was really good, but it just, I was going in there expecting it to be, like, the best one I've ever seen. Yeah. And yeah, after a while, it's... I... yeah, it's definitely up there, though. After a while, I just realized how lazy the third act was, and I just I gave up on loving it like everyone else. Oh, I did like the third act. I liked all of it, but it it was just like um, it's like oh they're gonna they're gonna have a face off, and it's gonna be on this big thing, and explosions are gonna happen everywhere, mm-hmm. and I I feel like it has twenty two Jump Street effect where yeah. it's fine as long as you make fun of the fact that you're being lazy. Yeah, I hate that about the twenty two Jump Street. Mm-hmm. But and people got away with it then, and people getting away with it now. Yeah. So, yeah. my opinion. Yeah. But so far, Fox, since Days of Future Past, I would definitely say has been on a good track record for their films. I'm scared about Apocalypse, though. See, I think Apocalypse looks good, but mm-hmm. again, having I've only seen Days of Future Past. Of any of the X Men films? Yeah. Wow. I grew up a very sheltered child. I, I saw my first R-rated movie at, like, 13, 14. Mm. And I didn't wow. see any PG-13 movie until I was, like, 10. So I was really far behind. Wow. Yeah. That, that's surprising. Um, uh, yeah. To, to go back to Gambit, though, are you familiar with um, Leia Sadu? I am not. Film me. Right. Okay, she's supposed to be the female lead in the film. But she, okay, I'm gonna go to IMDb right now just to double check everything that I'm about to say. But she is a huge up and coming actress. She was in Skyfall, I believe. Mm. She was in, um, no, she was in Spectre. Oh, she's, in, she's been in a couple um, Mission Impossible films before now. Okay. She's also in. She's also in one of the, one of my top ten films, Blue is the Warmest Color. Oh, okay. I recommend you watching it with the lights off with your parents not home. <laughs> okay, I've never seen that. Or even heard... I think I've heard of it, but I've never even... Like, I don't the, even know what it's about. Like, I just... I, the title sounds familiar, but I have no clue what you've seen about. It's a three-hour French lesbian romantic epic. It's very strange, but it's a great movie. <laughs> okay. And to go to go off of her films since that, you have Grand Budapest Hotel, a, re, a French reinterpretation of Beauty and the Beast, with, um... Vincent, uh, something. He's in the he's in Black Swan. Uh, Lo- the Lobster, Spectre. She's gonna be in Gambit and an- another film called It's Only the End of the World, which is the first English film by director Xavier Dolan. So she has a lot on her plate, along with. Or she has had a lot on her plate, and she could have a lot more contracts work out. So I'm worried that she might leave this project. Yeah, especially with the director already pushing back, too. And I am I wish they would have given the... I can't remember the guy. The guy that did John Carter and was the original Gambit. I wish they would give him a second chance and so I replaced him with Channing Tatum. Did you see John Carter? Yes, I did. I um Well, I can't say I've seen all of it. Um... I saw it for like a birthday party and I fell asleep <laughs> through a good interesting movie. Of it. Then, yeah, I have seen a lot though because I think it was on like we had stars on our TV and it was like one of their major films or something like that. So we got to watch it a lot. But I know that he has hasn't had the best track record, but I wish they would have given him a second shot like they gave Ryan Reynolds for the same film. Well, no, just looking at his, uh, he has a few big films that, with directing. He co-directed Bugs Life, and he directed Finding Nemo, Wally, and he's directing Finding Dory. 
But, I mean, John Carter's only live-action film, and that wasn't received very well, so that worries me a bit. Yeah. If he was still attached. Yeah. Yes, that's true. So what's your next piece of news? In an interview with Collider, Ewan McGregor expressed interest in starring in Star Wars anthology films about Obi-Wan, which said that was set between Revenge of the Sith and A New Hope. Well, uh, would you want to see these films? Um, I will this is going to be a big confession. I had not seen any of the Star Wars films. Any of them? Until Force Awakens came out. I was one of those kids that, like, hadn't seen a single Star Wars film, but I could, like, outsmart other kids that have seen all of them just by my, like, knowledge. Not really yeah, the I'm... prequels, but with the original trilogy. I may or may not have seen the original films. I don't remember. Mm-hmm. But I can, I can clearly remember watching all three of them in my friend's garage mm. of, of the prequels. Yeah. My, so, my, my whole knowledge of Star Wars is off of YouTube videos. <laughs> yeah. I know too much for someone that hasn't seen them in about uh, 10, 12 years. Yeah. But, I mean, just watching uh, the YouTube clips every now and then, he did give a, he was good for... The role he had, the role and the script he was given in those in yeah those three films. I feel like that's a lot of. I feel like even the prequels get a lot of hate, and rightfully so. I mean, they ruined the franchise. But I feel like because they haven't seen any of them. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but I feel like because even the YouTube clips I've seen like that. I feel like it wasn't the actors. I could say from the stuff I have seen, Hayden Christensen doesn't look that really good, but you and McGregor and, like, Liam Neeson and stuff like that, they never... It never seemed like it was, like, the acting fault. I feel like they went too big with the special effects. Pretty much. But, who am I to say? I haven't seen any of them. But I, I would be excited to see you and McGregor because once I did see The Force Awakens, I'm, like, hooked. And I want to see the original trilogy and all. Now I just haven't got the chance to. And don't own them. So, eventually. the biggest issue with the um the prequels is that in the original film, Luke has worked with a bunch of other people to make the films. Even if the first, even if A New Hope mm-hmm. did, did have a bit of a more whiny Luke and a bit more clunky dialogue and yeah. action scenes, it still made a, a lot of money. Mm-hmm. And with the legacy like that the um original trilogy made, they gave him full control over the prequels. Yeah, and that, so he was literally anything he said would have happened. There's there a lot, there's actually, um, I saw like a short documentary chron- chronalizing the, um, the production and the, um, eventual release of Phantom Menace, mm. where you just, you see him going to storyboard and say, this can't be in there, I want this to look like this with a, with his special highlighters, and he's like a, he's like a madman mm-hmm. with his eccentric vision of what he thinks the film should be and how we can, how we can recreate the masterpiece of, of the original trilogy, and it's... Or like a horror film, if you look yeah. at it from the right angle. And I, I think as long as he stays away from this, like he did Force Awakens, I think there could be potential for another great film. I, I think the problem with this movie is what's it going to be about? Because I feel like the whole entire point, and I might be wrong, because like I said, I haven't seen any of them, was that there's like nothing happened for a long time from the third film to the fourth one. And that's why it was all, like, ancient mythology. So would this Ewan McGregor film be, like, just him sitting in the desert, stalking a little kid, making sure he's safe? Well, I mean, that would be really fun to see. But I remember, um... Just all long shots, like, Revenant. But instead of trying to survive, it's just him stalking <laughs> a kid on tattooing. I'm just trying to imagine him fighting a space bear now. <laughs> but, um... A character was introduced in Star Wars Rebels recently. Again, having not seen the having not seen the series, that um, goes back to the old expanding universe novels where he had a wife. She oh. was beautiful, like you. <laughs> but um, so what what happened? Like that could be like the um. You are familiar with how um, how how some fans watch the um. All the movies has like a four, five, two, three, six order. Yeah, there's like that one with the. the yeah, it could yeah. be like that where they um, they like a big plot twist in the later films is that Ray 
is actually the granddaughter of Obi Wan. <laughs> that's what I. Uh, that's what I want that to be too, because I'm like one of the few people that have been saying that. Ever since the Force Awakens, all that speculation came out. I was like, she's definitely not uh, Skywalker. No. It, it would be very unlikely. I see her more as like a um, maybe an Ill- illegitimate daughter of Han. He had yeah. sex with some crazy space pirate as he was flying around doing his Han Solo stuff, and yeah. She just wound. She winded up on a desert planet with her memory wiped. Yeah, I could see that. I I just really hope because the whole entire problem. I don't. I actually don't even hope it's Obi Wan. I wish it was something like this old other Jedi. But I think Obi Wan's the most realistic thing because I feel like what they're doing is they're trying to expand expanded universe. And if they say that she's a Skywalker, it's just gonna make that universe even tighter than it already is. And connect everything once again. And I wish they would just expand it a lot more. Uh, that, that would be great instead of having Finn be Lando's son. Because God knows it can't be two black eyes in the galaxy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. What's our next news story? Following much excitement from Suicide Squad's second trailer... Warner Brothers have decided to do very expensive reshoots to add more humor to the film. I believe the approximate number was somewhere in the tens of millions of dollar price range. How do you think this will um, affect the final film? Um, I I hope it affects it for the better. The second Suicide trailer I thought was like perfect, and I was really surprised. So I'm I'm guessing what they were like they were like false advertising almost. Like oh this film's gonna be lots of fun. It's gonna be a lot. Of, it's good. There's gonna be a lot of jokes, and then the actual film is like the dark, gloomy, nothing fun. And I feel like they're going maybe to make it more like the second trailer. If that's what they're doing, I'm totally on board because I thought the second trailer was phenomenal. Uh, yeah, no disagreements here. I thought it was it was one of the most perfect trailers I've seen. I I I, 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 I'm, I have a bit of a hard on for when action goes right in with the music and when you have one, yeah. one of the greatest songs. Of all time, playing in the background with some of the greatest characters in, in, in any comic book. Yes. I can't help myself, but just nerdgasm everywhere. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, the, that... Bohemian Rhapsody has like, been probably like one of my... That's probably like my top five songs of all time. And yeah. to see it... And I was watching... There's like... I think the channel is called New Rock Stars. And they did like a 30 minute in-depth analysis of that trailer and like even the lyrics matched up to what's happening in the trailer wow really yeah like i'll try finding the link and sending it to you but it's amazing like just the analogies like even when like the lyrics aren't being said because like they're dubbing it over with like will smith talking or something like that like what would be saying right there is like applying to what is happening in the trailer and i i I'm so happy because the trailer had so much comic relief. Like, I remember Captain Boomerang just, like, stopping to drink a beer in the midst of, like, all this action. That was, like, I was laughing for, like, two minutes straight watching that. And so I I hope that they just add, like, five more of those into the film. Yeah, just the whole issue with the humor, though, is that I I think it was um, in the original interview they got about when they first heard about the reshoots. The person, I think it was the director or somebody in the production, so that every joke in the entire film was in that trailer. Oh. Yeah. So if they, if they did the reshoots, I'm sh- the reshoots, I'm sure fans would have been so pissed. Oh, it would have yeah. came up in most reviews, too. It's like, you want a funny film? Well, guess what? Watch the trailer, and that's all you're going to get. Yeah, because that's like if that's like the most fun that movie has is that, and then everything else is dark and gloomy, that, that I... It's good for them that they're going back. I, f- I wonder how much of this, too, is bad for Superman pressure. A lot. I can guarantee it's a lot of it. Plus, with how, with how people reacted to the uh, the stinted humor in that, it might, that also gives it a chance of failure. Yeah. Sort of worries me. Because I feel like they were almost like... I feel like Warner Bros. Warner Bros. Warner Brothers had confidence back for Superman. And then when the critics didn't like it, they were scared. And I feel like that, since they had confidence in Batman vs. Superman, they kept on doing that with all their other properties. And so I feel like they're going and changing everything now. I feel like there's no news about this with Wonder Woman, but I bet Wonder Woman's having the same changes, but it's just not as big of a deal because it's not like they can they can, they can can hide it right now since they're 
either in pre-production or filming right now. Yeah, and to keep as few spoilers in with Batman Superman as possible, they they did the same thing with Man of Steel. We're in one. We're in the final action sequence. You hear someone just scream. Uh, one of the news reporters just scream randomly. It's a good thing it's late and no one's on the pier, mm-hmm. and it was evacuated hours ago. So they they did try half heartedly. Yeah. To address the problems people had with the first film. Yeah. They're probably doing that again with this. Yeah, it was like nighttime, so everyone was off work, which it it I I I was thinking about that. I was like, well, at least like. 70% less people will die, but there's still going to be a lot of people dead. Yeah. But, yeah. What's our next piece of news? Following the rapid success of the first teaser, the production or Warner Brothers released a second teaser for Lego Batman. Having seen it, what are your opinions on it? Oh, I love this trailer. Even more than the first one. Like, whenever, like, it was just so great. Like, the whole mopey Batman thing. I was, like, laughing even before, like, they played on it. This him like, hey, I saved the world today. You'd be proud of me. I was like dying. And then Alfred gets kicked across the room into a piano. And that was so like Lego movie, like nonsense action that I loved it. And then the whole like references to all the previous Batman films. I was dying because I'm a huge Batman nerd and film nerd. Preach. So, so just like. The whole, like, the 2016 thing with Ben Affleck, I feel like that was more of a shameless marketing because it was out in theaters, but I was still okay with it. But, because I feel like Lego Batman is using Batman vs. Superman to promote itself anyways. But the whole, like, 1997 that just flashed George Clooney, like, (laughs) for, like, a split second, (laughs) I was dying. And the whole weird phase in 1966 and, like, 6, and they cut to the Bat-Tango, that was, I was... I was, the trailer looks so funny, and I wouldn't be surprised if this is my favorite Batman film after it comes out. Okay, you're, that's blasphemy if you're insulting the Dark Knight, but. I feel like there would be different Batman films, but I feel like it would be the, it would definitely be the most fun Batman film. I'm I'm watching you as you speak, but this is definitely a movie for for Batman fans and not for for, uh, the kiddies. Oh, yeah. So. I feel like. This film is gonna have like few comedy like um like physical comedy stuff that the kids will get, but I feel like all the references are just gonna be for the nerds. Which I I'm think okay I with. think it'd be like a um a comedic version of um of Inside Out, where mm. the kids will be laughing, but every once in a while you turn to see your uh your dad having a tear in his eye and, and you have no idea why. Yeah, <laughs> it'll be like that, except for the you know you know. Adult, the tear will be from laughing so hard that they crap their pants and yeah. have to go run to the bathroom. But the eight, like, cause the ABR thing, that didn't really have a Batman reference to it, but it was so funny. I've been quoting that like all week, like ABR always be recording. <laughs> that was I was, and I I've never really been a huge fan of Will Arnett. Like I liked his stuff on Arrested Development, but I felt like he was almost like that's the only thing he did. But this like everything. I'm not going to say it yet, because the film has still a long way to go, but I would say this almost almost might beat the Deadpool's marketing campaign. And I know that's a big thing to say, but I feel like it could get there. I feel like it's not there yet at all, but I think it has the potential to. I, I haven't even thought about it like that. Yeah, it could. If they had the right marketing standpoint from this, it could easily just get up there. Now that yeah. Deadpool is showing how to do proper marketing, I'm sure a lot of films will follow it too. Yeah, like did you see the? Especially with, I know Batman isn't like a very serious character, but Lego Batman almost has that same theme like that Deadpool can have, like with the fourth wall breaking. But he has almost like this. I he takes himself too serious and too arrogant. That's funny. Like, did you see the whole um, fake deleted scene or yeah, fake deleted scene on Jimmy Kimmel? Yeah. Because they had the Lego Batman theme in there with Will Arnett, and I thought that was hilarious. I feel like I could see Will Arnett doing more of that stuff just throughout, like, even, like, Suicide Squad. Like, I feel like they're going to put out a trailer, like, during Suicide Squad, making, like, just to promote the film. And I feel like this is going to be probably, like, it, it would definitely rival Deadpool's marketing campaign if it goes on the track it is right now. It already has the third wall stuff built in. I mean, just mm-hmm. going back to uh, the, tra- the trailer and where they had their poking fun at the old Batman films. And then oh, the yeah. original Lego movie where you had um, 
Channing Tatum as Superman making fun of um, Jonah Hill as Green Lantern. Mm -hmm. I'm not thinking about the character, it's the fact that the first, the original movie sucked, that's what they're poking fun at. Yeah. So they, they definitely know the audience they're going for, and they know how to strike a chord with them. Yeah, and even before this trailer starts, they did the whole opening introduction about, like, I'm so awesome, I get two trailers in a week, and stuff like that. I was, yeah. I was like, dying, even, I was dying of laughter before they even, like, the trailer even started. Because I was laughing at the intro. So, I'm super excited. Okay, we got four minutes left. Let's run through these last one. news stories. Alright. Uh, <laughs> I'll grab it in write a script for this. Um, Zack Snyder talked about an R-rated extended cut of Batman and Superman to be released in his Blu-ray special edition. The first, the first uh, scene off that cut was released online earlier this week. Having seen it, what are your thoughts on it, and what would it have added, added to the film to be in it? Um, I feel like it would have confused a lot of the mainstream audience. Um, I would have liked it. I feel like it does add some depth as to why Lex Luthor is crazy. And I'm excited for this R-rated cut, but I think it's only R-rated because, like, Batman says, like, the F word, like, twice in it or something like that, and that's why it's R-rated. There's no, like, major reasons. But it definitely... I mean, could, you never know, maybe Wonder Woman could go topless in it, in which case I know a lot of my friends are going to buy it buy it on Blu-ray. Yeah. But I feel like this scene... I think it helps set up the universe, in a, especially not, like, a crammed-in way, like the cyborg scene. Yeah. But I feel like it definitely, I feel like this could help set it up, but it would be like one of those scenes almost like with Thanos at the end of the first Avengers film, like where everyone was like, who is that? So, but I I do wish they would have included it in this, but I'm really excited for that R-rated cut because I feel like it's just going to be like 30 minutes of more explanation than I wanted, but with Batman cursing like twice. <laughs> There's probably going to be some more murder and some more close-up shots of blood, which which kept it out yeah. of our rating. But, yeah. um... Yeah, you, you basically <laughs> told, told all, the, all the words out of, out of my mouth. It really did give a reason to, um... For Alexander's insanity. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Even though we saw a little bit of it at the uh, the, the dinner party scene. Mm -hmm. Although, if it, gave, if, it gave, if it gave him a reason to uh, make the Granny's PhD, then all four would add it, add it back into the film. I, I think it was almost like the like the opening scene with him at the speech was just like here his here's him unstable, and then this is almost like a spark to be like oh yeah, this guy is gonna like I feel like that explains not to spoil it back for Superman but explains some of how he figured stuff out by the end of it. Like he, he was already a powder keg in that yeah that scene in the spaceship was just a spark to to uh, start the fuse yeah. So I feel like we're gonna see a lot more of Alexander. Hopefully, if they were smart, I hope they would do more. Okay, we've got a minute left. Let's go rapid fire. All right, uh, John Favreau's Jungle Book coming out to rave reviews. The scene was released earlier this week. What are your thoughts on it? Um, I thought the scene was great. It had um, Bill Murray, and even when like the bear was talking, it was like rubbing his chest and stuff like that. It was very casual. And I feel like it was Bill Murray, but in a bear. And I feel like it's perfect casting. And the CGI looks great, and I'm super excited for this film. Yes. I think it looks great. The CGI was great, but the, the, the cinematography reminded me of a video game, so I was sort of taken out of it. Oh, yeah. I can see that. Okay. What's our last news story? That was it. Oh, that was it? Yep. Oh, sweet. Okay, guys. Well, we're going to cut out to break right now. But we'll be back in five minutes to discuss our favorite movies about music. And why are we doing this again, James? For miles ahead and everybody wants some. Yep. So five minutes and you'll hear our thoughts on our favorite m movies, music films. I don't even know how to classify it. See you guys. Bye. Things that happen here, no stranger would it be. Okay, guys, welcome to the second part of our show. 
film culture podcast, and this week we're talking about our favorite films that have that are heavily influenced or are about music. So, James, we each have our top three. I'll let you go with your third one, and then I'll give you my thoughts on what my third one was and my thoughts on what your third one was. All right. So, for those of you watching, we did consult each other first. Mine is much more mod- uh, modern focused. Yeah. So to even things out, he went back and chose some older films, basically anything prior to 2000. Yep. That being said, my number three is Inside Lewin Davis, a beautiful, underrated Cohen masterpiece that is heartwarming and heartbreaking at the same time, with a phenomenal song. <laughs> Played by Oscar Isaac and Justin Timberlake, of all people. Mm. I don't, this is this is my favorite Coen Brothers films, hand down. I I never got really I never really got into No Country for Old Men. I I couldn't connect with Fargo. A lot a lot of their films just they don't have my sense of humor. But, but something about like the drama killers. of this one. Hmm? You don't like the Lady Killers? I haven't seen that. I only watch good films. <laughs> I like Lady Killers. I, I have class, huh? <laughs> I, know not, I know not many people like it, but I love the Lady Killers. It's so campy that I love it. You are banished from this podcast. Leave. <laughs> oh, Brother, Where Out There was about music, though, right? Okay, okay, yeah, I did like that one, but nowhere as good as Inside Lewin Davis. I, I'll admit, I've never seen Inside Lewin Davis. Mm. Is it based on... Okay, is Lewin Davis a real person? No. Okay. It's set, I believe, in the 1960s, mm. where folk music is is on the rise, and Oscar Isaac is a a drifter trying to find uh, some place he can call home while still while still, while still playing the music he loves. But folk okay. music is slowly on the down, being replaced by the poppy tunes of people like the Beatles and the Beach Boys. Yes. Okay. It's I I'm definitely want to watch this one. It didn't it take didn't it like sweep the Oscars the year it came out or at least had a lot of nominations? No, it didn't. It uh, I'll look it up right now. I think it had one. Maybe for I screenplay. Maybe that's maybe. maybe I heard of it being like snubbed then because I remember having something with the Oscars, but maybe it was just snubbed. Yeah, it was. Uh, okay. You're familiar with the smo- schmoes and Scott Mance. He, yeah. he, we share we share the same sentiments for the film. Where we, this is both our favorite uh, Coen Brothers film, and it's the second the second that this was uh, announced and had almost no nominations, he lost his mind, and it was fantastic. So, to Scott Mance, and if you guys aren't familiar with the Schmoes, go and watch them. Would this be the Citizen Kane of music films? <laughs> Well, this is number three, so I wouldn't think so. <laughs> but to Scott Manson, maybe. <laughs> Probably. What did he say? Okay. Was, that, that Go, was uh, going thing. from the nominations, it has two for the Oscars, cinematography and sound mixing. And the Globes called it a comedy, of all things. Oh, like The Martian. <laughs> yes, exactly like The Martian. At least the Oscars got that one right. <laughs> oh, God. All right, so what's your number three? My number three is... A film released in 1996, so barely before 2000, called That Thing You Do. And to talk about, this is like almost perfect, because Lewin Davis was getting replaced by the poppy tunes of the 60s. This is a band, like a one-hit band in the 1960s. It stars Tom Hanks as like the record producer. And I'm pretty sure it's direct... I can't remember who directed it. Oh, Tom Tom Hanks directed it. That's right. Okay, yeah, that's why I know this film. Yes, it was directed, written, and starring Tom Hanks. I don't think this was... This might be his directorial debut. I'm not sure. Pretty sure it's the only film he's ever directed. Yeah. But I love it. It has, um... I, I think Steve Zahn from um, Daddy's Daycare... Mm-hmm. Yes, Steve Zahn, and I, he's one of the main band members. It's a great film. It's based on a true story, and it's the like the song is called "That Thing You Do," and that's like their one hit. And as a fan, I am a huge fan of 1960s pop music, 
pop rock and a big fan of the Beatles. And so this was just a great film. The main problem I had with this category was there's a lot of films that have like incorporate music, but there's not that many films that I've actually watched that are like strictly about music. But I remember watching this like in I think seventh grade, seventh or sixth grade in like our music class. And it is a great film. Um in my opinion. Yeah, I think uh just to um classify everything else the way I saw it was music is used as a central theme. We uh on the mm-hmm. side we excluded musicals. Yeah. So what I what I stuck to is um films about musicians or musical biopics. Those were the two easiest easiest things for me to pull from. Yeah, my, I used themes that were heavily influenced by music like if there was a lot of mu- like if it was basically like a film that you would go into it knowing that this is pretty much all about music. I didn't do like just biopics or anything like that, but pretty much all of the films I have are all about music or feature music like more than they feature film. I do wish I included more films where music is a character on their own, like Dazed and Confused. Yeah. But to go off what you're saying about or what I was saying about musical biopics, my number two is Ray. Ray. Yes. Have you seen it? I have not. <laughs> okay. Be a fun podcast, everybody. Yeah, Ray is about um Ray Charles as portrayed by the Oscar winning Jamie Foxx. And Ooh. yeah, see there are I never knew a blind man could be so suave with the ladies. Yeah. But so it's Jamie Foxx. Yes. <laughs> it's he becomes Ray Charles and it is it is mesmerizing what he can do. Mm-hmm. Not only that, but the script itself, it I feel like it avoids the normal tropes of biopic and transcends itself and becomes the new best and the new stereotype of what yeah. film should achieve, like films like Walk the Line a couple years yeah. later. And I don't know. It really struck a chord with me. Is this the one that he won an Oscar for? Yes. Because this is one of the ones that Leo lost to, I'm pretty sure. See, 2004. Or no, maybe it wasn't Leo. Maybe it was um Russell Crowe. Because I think like one year Russell Crowe had it in the second year. That Jamie was 2001 Foxx. when Denzel Washington won for Training Day. Oh, yeah, it was Denzel Washington. They're not all the same. Yeah. Sorry, I know. I'm Again, racist. Exactly. <laughs> I think that came up last week, didn't it? About me being yes. racist? Yes, it did. So, yes. I'm the running theme. I'm... So our running theme so far is Friends on Netflix. Even though you I, finished I finished it, it actually. Yeah, you finished it now. I finally finished it, and I'm crying a little bit inside. But so are you gonna start now watching I'm, Daredevil? No, I'm back. I'm gonna do Breaking Bad, and then I'm gonna do Mad Men. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but we have that. Me being a racist, and my love for Scott Pilgrim vs. the World, and goodbye. Yes. All right. So, so um, how how about you throw us your number two? Speaking about my love for the Beatles, um, Across the Universe, have you seen this? I I have barely had any idea what it is. Oh, okay, well this is going to be even more fun. <laughs> um, so this, to people that do know Across the Universe, I'm a huge Beatles fan, so I was thinking about even like incorporating some of their early films like from the 60s. Across the Universe is past the 2000 mark, though, so it is a little bit more modern. This was like, a, I think... I don't know if it was British or American, but it takes place in New York. But it's set during like the 60s and 70s, and it's more of like a, um, kind of like a Perks of a Wall um, coming of age story, like early 20s. But the whole film takes place like during the time that the Beatles were around, and they like have tons of artists come in and sing popular Beatles song Beatles songs. Like I'm pretty sure you too goes in there and sings some songs, and they have tons of awesome cameos, but this film was so pretty much a way I can incorporate my Beatles love, and it's so great. I've watched it so many times, and I think a lot of people dislike it, but this is one of those films that, when it comes to music, I definitely love. I think it's because it features my favorite band, though. I'm not the hugest Beatles fan. I definitely respect them for the craft, Mm -hmm. but... (laughs) After watching Love and Mercy, it's hard for me to really compare, really to 
see them as anything more than uh, the Be- the Beach Boys' as rivals. Mm-hmm. Because um, what he did for uh, whatever the album was called, I, it bl- I'm blanking on it now, but it was so mesmerizing to see what he could do in that. Yeah. But across, the other thing about Across the Universe is it's it's almost like a period place. So, like, I guess I did kind of choose, like, an old-time film. Like, it's set during the 70s and 60s, and it's very stylized. And that's something I definitely... I like stylized movies. As you can probably tell, since I'm a big Edgar Wright and Quentin Tarantino fan. But it has so much good imagery that goes along with the Beatles music, and that's why I like it so much. Hmm. So what's your number one favorite My number one... My number 19 film of all time, yes, I tracked it, is Whiplash. Please okay. tell me you've seen this one. <laughs> I've kind of seen it. Oh, God. And when I say kind of seen it, I've seen the short film. That okay, this... so you've seen one of the best parts, then. <laughs> yes, and I have seen a lot of scenes. Like, like every scene that's pretty much available on YouTube, like through movie clips I've seen. And it looks amazing. It's just one of those ones I still haven't got around to. I haven't had the ability to watch it. If it was on Netflix by now, I definitely would have watched it. It's something I would I, watch. I implore you, sir, to watch it the second you we stop this recording. It is a modern masterpiece. J.K. Simmons in one of the best performances of the decade. Miles Teller in a star-making performance. Would you say he was fantastic? Hmm? Would you say Miles Teller was fantastic? God damn it, Joe. (laughs) Leave leave this chat room now. One of the best goddamn scores in years. Only only really rivaled by Mad Max Fury Road. Mm. And, oh my god, I cannot sing the praises of this film enough. And... Okay, you you play an instrument, right? Are you in your you're in your school's band? I used to, I played I was in band from like fifth to sixth grade. Oh. I I played saxophone, and when I say I, I played saxophone, that means that I played it occasionally at practice, but <laughs> by the time performances would happen, my reed was always broken, and I would lip sync with the band to make it look like I was playing. Yeah, I, I played trombone for three years, and I got really popular with that, if you couldn't tell. Mm-hmm. So. <laughs> oh, you, you know, we all know the ladies love the trombone players. Ah, uh, yes, all the boner jokes in the world. Yep. I am scarred from those years. Yep. <laughs> but, this um, rough. Every, every person I know who's into music, or a musician, I, I tell them they have to watch this. Because mm-hmm. there is nothing greater and having someone screw up during performance and going up to them and reside and reciting anything J.K. Simmons says and scaring the ever loving crap out of them. Mm-hmm. It is glorious. Mm-hmm. J.K. Simmons always has a huge part of my heart. There's two actors. There's I live in Montana. I'm originally from Missoula, Montana. If anyone's listening from Missoula, Montana, and you can you can haunt you can stalk him at this address. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm not in Missoula, Montana anymore, but that's my hometown and always will be but and it's such a great little town but we only have had like two film things because montana is really known for film but we had dana carvey and an honorable mention for my film he went to the same high school that i went to freshman year sentinel oh you bastard and jk simmons missoula montana is the home of university of montana and that's where J.K. Simmons went. So, and since I'm a big drama guy, like all over all of our stuff there at University of Montana is all J.K. Simmons, because he's like one of the few actors that have done something. J.K. Dan Carvey has done great things too, but totally different tiers of stuff. One's comedy, and the other one's great drama performances and comedy with the Spider-Man role, but. J.K. Simmons has always been a great talent, and this, like the short film that I saw, that was so evil. I hated J.K. Simmons, and that's hard for me to say because I love J.K. Simmons. That scene is exactly in the movie, but with Miles Teller, and it gets a lot worse from there. 
Was it Miles Miles Teller in the short film? Uh, no, no. He oh, was, wait, um, yeah, it wasn't. It was a different guy. Yeah. So because, basically, what happens is um he get he um he tries to get in to this prestigious college band, and once he's in, uh, J.K. Simmons is just on his ass and trying to um trying to make him better by screaming at him. Mm-hmm. And uh, a lot of teachers I know. They don't like the film because it portrays um, it it, portray, it portrays teachers and their method of teaching, mm-hmm. and gives some people the you know, false idea that all teachers do this. Yeah, and this, that is this is the only way to get um, profanity out of your students. Mm-hmm. So it's a little bit controversial in that section, but other than that, you have you anybody has to watch it. It is phenomenal. Oh, and I, he was so manip, uh, manipulative. I don't even know. He was he knew how to work the scene like even beforehand or I think I can't remember because it's been a while since I've seen the short film. It was either during a break or beforehand when he was like talking about him with his history. He's being all nice to him and stuff like that, and learning about his family and stuff like that. And then like as soon as it happens, he just he pushes turns it on that, him. and he turns it on him and makes it like I was like heartbroken watching that. I was like this is so, but it was so great. It was so stressful. It made me feel so many things that I think a film hasn't done in a while. And I want to see an hour and a half long version of that short film. Yeah, it's There are a couple flaws, but it's I definitely put your time into it. There, there are plenty of people who aren't even movie fans who've uh-huh. watched and sing its praises so highly. It's uh-huh. I haven't heard one person who has legitimate issues with it and hates it. Yes. Everybody is just huge fans, and oh god! I just stop before I continue rambling. Okay, continue. So with your list. My number one film, music film of all time. I'm a huge Justin L fan, and I'm not gonna say Wayne's World, even though that's probably one of my honorable mentions. Because we're gonna we're gonna have some time left over at the end of this to go over honorable mentions, just talk about music films. Oh god, honorable mentions. <laughs> this is my. This is the film that I grew up watching, and that's the reason that this is my number one, because this is my favorite film as a little kid. This R-rated film about music was my favorite thing to watch as a one, two, three, and four-year-old, because, and the only reason I loved it so much was because of the music, because I had no clue what was going on. Watching now, I enjoy it for totally different reasons, but my number one film is Blues Brothers, which is so great dan Aykroyd, probably the second funniest he's been after ghostbusters and john belushi not as funny as animal house of course but in his like prime because i think john belushi pretty much was in his prime the whole entire time because unfortunately he didn't he passed know. away young yeah but this film is so great, has so many memorable lines. I still quote Dry Toast and uh, I can't remember the other one right now. I, just, I can't, I'm brain firing, but this film is so great. And I love like the, um, oh, I can't, oh, I can't believe, I want to, ah, oh, oh, I can't believe the church scene and they have the best, this has so many great cameos. I think Ray Charles is in Blues Brothers. He is, actually. Yes. And that's a great scene. Like, every scene that the music comes on, they're so elaborate and so over the top and so much fun. And that's why I like that such a little kid, because there's so much movement. But uh, I can't remember who it is in the final scene, but the church scene, you see John Pelushi doing, like, 20, like, handstands. Handstand flips. I don't even know. I can't talk right now. Back it, springs is the technical yeah. term. Because, like, you probably know how that is. When, when you get to, like, one of your all-time favorite films, you just ramble on, and you have no coherent thought whatsoever. But, okay, I, yeah, my, go ahead. My favorite film for uh, at least a year was The Dark Knight, and I knew every single line of The Joker. That yeah. That is legitimate. That is a technical insanity. Mm-hmm. Me- medically insane. So you can't... Yes, I know the pain of talking about your favorite films. But oh, yes. I haven't seen Blues Brothers in a couple years. Oh. But from what I remember, yeah, it was freaking hilarious. Steven Spielberg makes a cameo in this. 
as we talked yes, about before. Last week. But, oh, I can't... And, and his underselling masterpiece, 1941. <laughs> oh, John Belushi in that is, like, the that only reason... I, I enjoyed that. You need to watch that film. Like, you need to cut together the John Belushi part to make, like, a five-minute short film, and that's, like, the best thing about 1940. Because me and my dad rented it, and they're like, 1941, directed by Steven Spielberg, starring John Belushi... This has to be the best film ever. And then, not really. I can really. tell you it's not. And John Belushi's literally in the film for like five minutes. But it's so great the parts he's in. Like, he flies off with the gasoline still on his airplane. And that was funny. But pretty much other than that. I'm trying to remember who it is. James Brown is at the end. I'm pre- Okay, I might be saying this way wrong, but I'm pretty sure James Brown... It's like it wouldn't pastor. surprise me. Yeah, he's like a pastor at church, and they're doing all this huge stuff. And that's that scene alone is like a favorite thing. And you have the police chase. Like, I think they set the movie record for most crash cars. Uh, yeah, at the so. time. Yeah, at the time. And Blues Brothers 2000 does not exist, no matter what anyone tells me. What, what, what film? I've never, I've never heard of it. Yeah, that. Good job, James. Um, <laughs> But this film is literally so great. And just, like, the like my dad has albums of the Blues Brothers. Like, actual albums of the Blues Brothers. This is this is such a great film. And this is, I would say this definitely makes this, like, the best. Like, you have Justin Bieber, Never Say Never, or the Jonas Brothers. You know when, like, they're making a film about themselves? And it's horrible. The Blues Brothers, since they were, like, fake characters anyway, this is, I would say, hands down, even better than 8 Mile when it comes to, like, their own artists making a movie about themselves. Now, now that we're done with this, what is your favorite, just some honorable mentions about films with music? Well, um, like we mentioned earlier, one of them was, um, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? I've seen it. Probably three or four times. Yeah, it's one of the films where I'm not gonna break out gust like gut busting laughing, but mm-hmm. it's so entertaining to watch, mm-hmm. and I don't know. It, I find it endlessly rewatchable mm-hmm. because it's it looks really nice and has the music is really catchy. And that was but the first it, film where they did the color correcting theme, and that became like a huge trend. Yeah. And it- okay, just before I forget it, mm-hmm. uh, we were talking about. Um, People, you know, just reviews on 1941. Apparently, Steven Spielberg has executive produced all the Transformers movies. What? Yep. I'm surprised they haven't even used that in the trailers. I, I think, like, for the next one, if they want anyone... Actually, I'm not even going to say that because the mainstream audience loves that. I hate the Transformers films. And this is why I hate people. <laughs> <coughs> yes. Um. I, yeah, other, other than that, I can't think of anything because all my... All my picks would have been musicals. Okay, well, let me give you some films. School of Rock. Yes. Well, did you like School of Rock? I loved it, but I haven't seen it in probably yeah. eight years. I definitely wouldn't say it's a masterpiece of any sorts, but I would say, especially when, because you and me are about the same age, when that came out, we were like 10, 12, pre-teens. This is everything. This is our, this is like our starting rebellion. This is like our first. This is my first introduction into like this generation Fight Club. Yes, like <laughs> that's a bad analogy. <laughs> <laughs> that's horrible to think. This is what's wrong with our generation. Is school of, school of rock is our Fight Club. <laughs> but, we are men. <laughs> but this because I listened to rock, of course, as a kid. Like I said, I was a huge Beatles fan, but like never hard rock like that. Never like ACT, ACDC, Metallica stuff. But that Missing was out, such a great film. Like that was like my first introduction to Miranda Cosgrove. I think that was my first introduction to Jack Black at the time too. And it was so oh, yeah, probably me too. Maybe I saw um, Kung Fu Panda first, but no, Kung Fu Panda came out a lot longer. Yeah, yeah, but I didn't see it until. Oh, you didn't see School of Rock? Ah, oh, School and Joan. I, I lose my timing with movies. Yeah. Oh, that's gonna be fun for a third act of this. <laughs> But, oh damn it! Yeah. But anyways, I, I, 
I got one to top you. Have you seen Frank? Frank. Oh, this is, um, oh, Michael Fassbender, right? Yes. I have not seen it, but I saw the trailer oh. for it, and it's one of those films. Oh, it like, is so good. Is it on Netflix? Oh. It was. I'm not sure if it is anymore. Oh, if it, I'm going to check like as soon as we're done with this to see if that's enough. I'll check right now since I'm on my computer. Oh, okay. But, all right. He is it, is. it is an Oscar worthy performance. The depth that he can, sh- the depth that he, that he can show with that huge mask on his head. And it's but about it is, music. Yeah, it's um, it's basically imagine the, you know how people always make fun of indie bands having a weird sound. Yeah. It's basically they, they just slam everything together and hopefully it makes music. Oh. Yeah, it's, but there's like, um, there's a science to the madness, and he's like, he's like, um, like an autistic genius. Oh, okay. Where he, it just, it's so So it's like Rain Man. Profound. Yeah. Music. And he's wearing a huge paper mache mask the whole time. <laughs> yes. That and sounds awesome. I think it's Carrie Mulligan plays his girlfriend, and she, she is so fun. It's, yes. It is so criminally underrated. Okay, it's still on Netflix. Okay, so I'm going to watch so that. So you're watching it tonight. <laughs> yeah. Okay, some other films. Did I bring up This is Spinal Tap? No, you haven't. Okay, This is Spinal Tap is a film I desperately would have easily put at number one. The only problem with it, I haven't seen it, but everything <laughs> I have heard about it is phenomenal. So, but have you seen This is Spinal Tap? I have seen ten minutes of it and I got bored. Really? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not a huge fan of documentaries or mockumentaries for that matter. Okay. The only well, one I can really remember loving is Jesus Camp, but that was because the um, people in there were monsters, and it was really funny watching yeah. the extent of what they do. Uh, what about some newer films that are more mainstream? What about the Pitch Perfect franchise? I was just about to bring that up. Second one is annoying as hell, but I really love the first one. Yeah, I would, I would admit, I was disappointed with the second one. It wasn't yeah. as good. But the first my dad, one... My, we own the Blu-ray, and my dad has seen it about 12 times. The second one, or the first one? The first one. Okay, phew. I was like, yeah, he's a little weird, really but... loves Pitch Perfect, too. Oh, my dad is, too. We, But we love, he loves movies, and he's like, him and my mom are, like, the main reason I love movies as much as I do today. But the first Pitch Perfect, like, I was like, this is weird. This is all girl humor. I don't really like it, but then, like, the Asian girl speaks. I'm not trying to be racist, but I don't know how to describe her. The, the only Asian girl there, I'm, <laughs> yes. you can say that is fine. Jackie Chan's sister. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> They're not all the same, Declan. <laughs> okay, um, Bruce Lee's sister. No, I'm joking. But anyways, <laughs> um, when she speaks and it's all this little humor, and I have I have great hearing, not to brag, probably, I probably don't, but anyways, every line that she says I, like, die with laughter. And that's, like, the moment I was hooked. Like, um... Like, I forgot his name, the fat character in Office Space. Oh, Melvin. Yes. You took you took my stapler. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, yes. But, like, the whole, like, I ate my twin sister in the womb. I like to start fires for fun. Just those weird lines of humor that are such my humor. Got me. It's it's dark and random and it appeals to our generation so much. Yes. And I, another honorable mention, my favorite film of all time, Scott Pilgrim vs. the World. I was going to put it as number one in this, but I feel like music almost takes a back seat in that film and isn't like the main thing. And so I thought I would save that for later. You could always um you could always use it as like say the the like I said earlier, the music is a character in a film. Yes. In which case, I could use something like Perks of Being a Wallflower or 500 Days of Summer yeah. or anything Tarantino. Yeah, but I feel like the, the music, music can, yeah, really adds something to the whole movie. Yes, but I feel like almost the sound effects in Scott Pilgrim even rival the music. But the music that's in Scott Pilgrim is perfect because everything about that film is perfect. I'm willing to say <laughs> that. My favorite film of all time, if I had to choose one, because as a film fan, you probably know this, it's hard to choose a favorite film of all time. But if I had I, to, I, I use Letterboxd, not yeah. promoted. Yeah. So I, I, every time I have something that might be there, I have to rank it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. So I, I do have a list. Okay. Which we, which we can get to yes, after the break. Okay, and guys, it's time to go to break.
Hello guys and welcome to the third part in our talk show. You guys are listening you probably hear that iconic Rocky theme song. But slightly altered, so it's license free. <laughs> but very smart of you. Yes. But that is because it is game time in this third thing. For a little game in honor kind of as you're talking about with Scott Mance. Now if you are not familiar with Scott Mance audience Definitely go check out the Smos and Profiles. That's a great film podcast. Along with that, go to Collider Videos <coughs> and check out the Smowdown against him and the outlaw, John Roca. That was a great match. That was Don't a- want to spoil who wins to anyone. It was very sad, but it was a great match. Oh, yeah. Definitely a lot of controversy there. But the thing that most people don't know about, if you don't know about Scott Mance, he is a big guy when it comes to movie releases. And knowing the date that that film came out... Now, I'm not like Scott Mance in any sort of way. I don't know if you are, James. A little bit. I can, I can do years. That's how I am. I can do years pretty confidently. Maybe one or two off. But if you guys, seriously, go check out everything that Scott Mance is part of. Access Hollywood. Everything. Because he can tell you like the exact date. The first like showing. like The weather that day. He knows like everything about the day movies come out. What he did in the movie theater when he first saw it. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> he, he could pretty much tell you what he was wearing, like how much the how much it cost for the ticket, everything. But anyways, this date we, we're probably gonna come up with a catchier name if this goes well and it's in a madhouse, and we can probably try doing this game again sometime. But this is the re- the movie release date game, or hopefully changed later. But how this is gonna work, James, is we each have prepared five films. And those five films, we're going to ask each other, and we're looking for the release date. Now, you get one point for the year, two points for the month, and three points for the date. But you can only get that third point if you got the right month, and you can only guess the month if you got the right year. So this is probably going to be a lot of guessing. Fifteen points possible. Are you ready, James? Uh, sure. Let's see how this works. My computer timer just started counting down, so hopefully we can get through this in time. Oh, okay. Wh- what is your first film? My first film, I'm sorry, starting easy, The Dark Knight. Oh, oh, darn it. Oh, my gosh. The Dark Knight, 2008. One point. Oh, gosh. I want, I'm not going to cheat. I should definitely know this. I'm, like, staring at it right now on my cabinet. I'm, like, so tempted to grab it. 2008. I want to say it came out around my birthday. So I'm going to say August for the month. And you lost your points. Darn it. You got the one. So I got one point. It was released July 18th, 2008. Darn it. I should have guessed July. I knew it was summer. It was close. Okay. Your first film. And... James, as I've already explained to you, but the audience does not know, all of yours are somewhat movie related. All of my, all of my films, <coughs> I picked off my favorite list, my favorite of all time. You, okay. sir, have picked films related to music. Yes, in honor of today's episode. So yes. your first movie is This Is Spinal Tap. Released in 1982. Wrong. Ah. Uh, 84. Yes, 84. Damn it! Damn it! Mark. Ah. Uh. March I'm so 2nd. I lost it. March 2nd, 1984. You were very confident, like 1982. I would have gotten I would have gotten March, so Yeah. If if this was the movie 1982 or the book 1982. That the March, book is 1984. Oh. That shows you how <laughs> stupid I am. <laughs> okay, what is my second film? Your second film is American Psycho. Oh gosh. Gosh. Oh, gosh. I want to say this is pre-Batman. First Batman came out in 2005, I believe. So I'm going to say 2003. Is that your final answer? (laughs) I'm not sure if you're, like, messing with me because I got it right or from way off. I'm going to say 2003. That is incorrect, sir. It was released April 14th, 2000. Oh, wow. That came out... That that explains why I thought it was like nineties film, but I always thought it was two thousand one. Okay, your second film in honor 
of it. And I've actually mentioned all of these films, except for one or two of them. Pitch Perfect. Pitch Perfect. I know it came out in 2012. Yep. That's the easy part. Um, let's see. I'm going out, going between August and September. They wouldn't do a summer movie. They wouldn't do a um a newer movie like that during the summer ten pole season. Yeah, but they probably wouldn't. Would they dump it in the early March area? Oh god, I don't know. I hate you so much right now. Oh god. Okay. Um. Yeah, so tend to t- to type it in. Uh, let's see. You already got one point. This is for two. What month? We have- I'm going to go September. Ooh, super close. October. Oh, I, was, I didn't even have it right. October 4th. October 4th. All right. All right. Extra points if you even know this film. Oh, gosh. <laughs> the lowest on the lowest out of all, all of my films on this list. Legend of the Guardians, The Owls of Gahul. Oh, this is Zack Snyder. Yep. This is like one of the few films of his that... I would say, I would definitely say that's probably his best film. Maybe after 300. Okay, this is a Nickelodeon film. I know that. It's, it's recent. Like, I would say it's in the 2010s. Say 20... 20... Oh, gosh. 2012. Is that your final answer? Yes. It was released in 2010. Oh! September 24th. <laughs> See, when it comes to the older films, I have, like, a really good idea, but when it comes to the newer films, everything just blends together. Well, give it some time, maybe you'll get one. <coughs> yeah. Okay. Your third film. I want to talk about music. This barely has any music, but it was one of the few ones I can think of. This is more of an honor of Easter. Hop. Okay, I thought you were going to go Passion of the Christ. <laughs> no. Hop. Because this Hop has music, too, because he's a drummer. Okay. I know it had Russell Brand in it. Yep. And it was probably, when was Russell Brand popular? It was probably after after he went to rehab and got off coke. So it probably it's, it has to be recent. But how recent? I'm going to say 2011. Correct. April. Ooh. No. It's May, isn't it? March. Uh, March right, 30. Yeah. We're doing great at this game. Yeah, it, you're like one day off from it being April. Okay, what is my fourth film? You're winning, by the right. way, James. It's two to one. A right. low-scoring game. The most criminally underrated film that I have ever seen. Directed by the brilliant Martin McDonough in Bruges. I have never even heard of this film. Oh, oh, my heart. I'm going to take a random guess. Let's see how great I am at this. In Bruges. What's it about? Who stars in it? Just give me that. Colin Farrell and Brendan Gleeson. Oh, okay. So, pre... No, after 2000. Let's say 2006. Is that your final answer? Yes. It was released in 2008. Ah! February 29th. <laughs> I was still hoping that, like, one of these times you're going to say, say your final answer, I'm going to say yes, and you're like, that is correct, but not yet. Now, I really hope that you have not chosen this film yet. Clockwork Orange. Oh, This has nothing oh, to do with music. 1971. This was <laughs> so I could embarrass you, James. 1972. No! <laughs> 1972. It's been number four of all time. How do I get that wrong? February 2nd, 1972. I was so close. Yes, you were. Okay, okay. You will not get this right. Okay. This is my entire career on this. Okay. Mr. Smith goes to Washington. Oh, okay. I know this one. I, I... Do you? I know the time period. <laughs> Assuming other random guess. But I don't. Uh, uh, Progress- progressively getting harder and harder. James Stewart. I know that. Um, when was James Stewart 
relevant. See. The question is, was this early post-Silent Era, or was it Vertigo Era? Uh, okay, I must think, 30s, this is like during World War, not, this is like right before World I don't know, I don't know how history works. Let's say, I, I want to say it's the 40s, but I want to say it's the 30s, so let's go 1939. God damn it. Okay. Did I get that? <laughs> one point, that's one point. I got that! That's one point, okay, it's two to two. Alright, no, once I have, month. I feel like it's an Oscar contender, but I'm just saying that because it's, like, relevant, but I don't know if that existed back then. Let's see, what, Pitch Perfect came out in October. As Mr. Smith goes to Washington, like, Pitch Perfect, I don't know, but that's October. I swear to God, you have it pulled up on your, on something. I don't have it pulled up at all. It, it, it's, I mean, it's October. I'm randomly guessing. It is October? Yes. Let's say October 31st. Let's say it came out on Halloween. Nope. O- October 19th. Mm. Alright. So I need to get the year to stay in the game. Yes. Of this last... I am... It's two to three. Oh, wait. I get two points. That's right. Yeah. The month. Okay. I don't even know how this game works. I'm the one that invented it. Okay. It is two four, to three. It's four to two. Your oh. final... Wait. Two to three? Yeah. What? No, because I got a point for um one of them. You got a point for the Dark Knight. Dark Knight. And then I got a point for the year for Mr. Smith. Yeah. And then I got two points. Oh, they the stack. Of... I thought it was just yeah. one and two and three. I thought it was... Oh, oh yeah. Th- never mind. Yeah, that is how it works. All right. That's yeah, two to three. You have to get the year to stay in this. School of Rock. Okay. I for sure. I just saw this. On Linklater's IMDb page. So Wait, does Richard Linklater direct School of Rock? Yeah. What? And, and wow. he's producing the TV series. There's a TV series? Yeah, it's in production right now. Oh, I think see. they're casting. Let's see. So, question is, was it just after or just before? Remember this. I'll give you a hint. Sorry. This is the Fight Club of our generation. Thank you. And I'm pretty sure this film comes out after 2003. Fight Club. Yes. Yeah. All right. So, hmm. We are okay, now tied. would be Oscar contender, but they wouldn't dump it in the early season. No, they wouldn't. And remember, this is a Nickelodeon film. Okay. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go with my baby. I let's go September. That is correct. Yes. I feel like you're yes. <laughs> and then September uh, 18th. September 18th. No, September 24th. Okay, I won. No, because I still. Be proud of me, mother. Don't I still have one more? No. What? Oh, darn it! You won by one <laughs> point. Final score is four to three. Ba dum bum. Ba dum uh, bum. Okay. Well, I pulled up some extra ones just in case. So I thought you were gonna have Clockwork Orange maybe on your list. So, right. when did Tenacious D and The Pick of Destiny come out? No idea. I'm gonna say 2004. 2006. That was my second guess. <laughs> All right, and then the okay. other one I had, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. The Wild Stallions themselves. That's the original. Yes. I'm going to say 1992. No, way off. 1989. That was my that was my second guess. <laughs> was it sequel 92? Probably. I don't know. I didn't have that one right down. Those were the only backup ones I had. All right. Since we have a lot of time before we have to end it. Do you yes. want to continue, or? Yes. Do you want to go back to talking about movies, or do you want to quickly, I mean very quickly, have a bonus round of this game? Well, since you just gave me, I'm going to give you one more, and we can go from there. Okay. I'm going to ask you about the classic, the original Point Break. Oh, gosh. Um. <laughs> um. Early nine. This is... Post, um, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure for Keanu Reeves. Let's say 1991. All right. Is that what's the mark? Oh gosh, this is definitely a summer movie. I would think. I'm not sure. I'm gonna say July, dead summer. 
All right. Month. What's the day? Oh gosh, I was gonna say fourth, but I did say October thirteenth for. I mean October thirty first for um. Um, Mr. Smith. So I'm gonna say July. Um. Um, I don't know. Point break. I'm trying to think of Hot Fuzz right now because they watch it, and that's my only exposure to Point Break. Oh no! I haven't seen it. Oh, you totally Except should. I've seen the clips in Hot Fuzz, so I'm trying so to think if point. they mention it. You know what? Let's just go 12. Oh. July 12th. Is that what you're saying? Yep, July 12th. Why? Why would you say July 12th? I don't know. I just chose twelve. You, you sure about that? Yeah, is it twelve? Is that your, is that your final answer? Now you're making me question it. I feel like you're trying to give me a hint to go in the wrong direction. I mean, go in the right direction. Like I'm way off. Is that your final answer? You know what? No. Let's go July twenty eighth. Is that your final answer? No. I'm, nah, July twenty eighth. Not gonna trick me. Is that your final answer? Yes, July twenty eighth. The correct answer. Was July twelfth? What? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like the easiest, I mean, like the luckiest guest of my life, and I just threw it away. I gotta go with my gut. Like you have to go with your second thought, because you're always getting the second day that you're thinking in second year. So I have to go with my gut. July twelfth. That stinks. That make that makes me upset now, James. You tricked me. You betrayed me. I know that was the point. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's talk about some of the films that we brought up. So these are your all-time favorite films. Well, some of them. They're not like your. This is all of them are on my list. Yes. So I want to know what that Bruges film was, or whatever. You In said. Bruges. In Bruges. It, it starred. Um, Let me find my phone so I can search it. Yes. It's the, oh my god, I don't know why I'm blanking. Colin Farrell and Brendan Gleeson, they're assassins hiding out in Bruges, waiting for the next, um, waiting for the next contract. Where, what's Bruges? It's a, um, it's a city in Germany, or Belgium. Yep, okay. Sounds Belgium-ish. Okay, I just searched it, in Bruges. Oh, darn it. Rated R. Oscar nominated for screenwriting. Hmm. That's. I don't know why it is, but it's it's so, it's subtly brilliant, and it's it has a very dark tone, but its comedy is so off the wall. It's is it kind of like British wit? It's uh, have you have you seen Seven Psychopaths? Yes. It's, it's from like the that? same director. Oh, that I I'm, I'm surprised I haven't very heard strange this humor. Film. I'm surprised I haven't heard this film. It has a eighty four percent on Rotten Tomatoes. An eight out of ten on IMDb, and Roger e Roger Ebert has it ranked four out of four. Wow, really? Yes. Mm. So it's Roger Ebert approved. So that's what matters. Now, have you seen Tenacious D in the Pick of Destiny? No. Do you know what Tenacious D is? Of course. Okay. Yeah. That's it, it's weird to think that three years after School of Rock, Tenacious D came out. Well, they they existed for years. It's just the movie came out. Yeah. I I, just, I can't imagine watching a full movie that's based off a little. That's basically sort of side joke to Jack Black's whole career. Yes. It. I haven't seen it full way through. I've seen bits and pieces. Have you ever heard the song, um, the best song ever by them? I I know the SpongeBob version of the best day ever. <laughs> no, this is better than SpongeBob or better than the One Direction, Harry Styles, Christopher Nolan, starring music video. Well, you, you don't know that yet. <laughs> yes. Um, I, oh, I'm trying to think. Uh, uh, what's this? Is it? It's like songs like "We Are the Key" or something like that. One of them, I think one of them. But the song I'm talking about by them is called like the best song ever, or no. this is a tribute by them. No. That is the best. Now, we were going to talk about musicals sometime later in this. Maybe for La La Land, but that's closer to Oscar season. 
Oh, that, that takes forever. It does. That, that's, that's okay, though, because... Can't wait for it, though. Oh, my yeah. God. Damon Chazelle doing an actual musical? <laughs> <laughs> that Don't laugh be... at me. I, I'm coughing. <laughs> I'm, like, dying. But, like so... You said your favorite music film of all time was Whiplash. Yes. Now, what about Whiplash makes it so the greatest film, music film of all time? Well, having having not seen Spinal Tap, we're almost famous. Yes. It's well, I you I've I've already said I am so utterly in love with the Joker. And J.K. Simmons' character has sort of the uh, same insanity as him. Oh, okay. not, to the, not to the point of, um, you know, murdering hundreds of pe- people or trying to manipulate people's uh, thoughts into doing certain things. Mm-hmm. But there's a, a certain calculation to his madness and his mm-hmm. intensity that's, I don't know, it's, um, I'm going to say it again, there's a subtle brilliance to what he does. Yeah. Like, a, like an evil mastermind, like a Bond mm-hmm. villain. Now, but where is it ranked on your list? It is number eighteen, ahead uh, of Four Sun, behind me, Earl and the Dying Girl. Mm. How far does your list go? I have forty six films currently. Forty six films, and wow. Yes. I'm okay. I'll 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 do this. I'll make a list of my top fifty films, which is gonna be tough. But I'll try to have it done by next week, so that every time I mention any of my favorite films, I can tell you where it is on the list. No, Declan, don't. You'll kill yourself. No, I'm going to go... No, trust me. I got this. I'll watch 50, 50, 50 movies in the next week. You'll watch 50 movies within the next week? Yes, in the next week. Rank them. And that's, you know, involving school time play practice everything i'm gonna watch 50 films and then critique them and make a list of where they are and wait i can't even watch 50 films i have to watch more than 50 films because some are gonna be like right at 51 52 the question is i've i'm gonna do all my tens on imdb and see what i could fill my last four slots with okay that sounds good so then eventually on this podcast, we can have it ranked, and then we can even bicker at each other when a certain film is ranked higher than another. But like, like there's films like the aforementioned Inside Lewin Davis, and I have like Casino Royale. That you know, they're they're fantastic films, but they're not going to be on that list. They're honorable mentions. Yes, they just don't hold. They don't hold up to the echelon of everything else. Yes. So let me ask you real quick, just spit firing. Where is Clockwork Orange rank? I thought you said number four. four. Right? What is your number? Well, actually, no, I don't want you to spoil what your number one is. Because I feel like that could be an episode, like our top three films of all time. But. It, it'll come out eventually. What is like five on that list? Number five is Perks of Being a Wallflower. Okay. Please tell me The Shining is on your list. It is not because I see it as a comedy and not a horror film. Okay. Pulp Fiction. I prefer Reservoir Dogs. Reservoir Dogs. <laughs> yes. Where is it on your list? Number 17. Seven, so, Whiplash you think is better than Reservoir Dogs? It is slightly below Reservoir Dogs. Oh, slightly? So Whiplash is 18? Whiplash is 19. Reservoir Dogs is 17. Okay, then what's 18? Meet Earl and the Dying Girl. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, you've mentioned it. Sorry, like I said, I'm stupid. <laughs> but, okay, so this is, I'm just going again. This random films. The Dark Knight, since you say it. Say no, it. Number two. Number, oh, gosh, I'm heading up the Okay. Um, did Jane go Unchained? It was a... It was definitely up there, but I haven't seen it since it first came out, so I have to rewatch it to see if it holds up. Okay. Well, we're coming to the end of time right now. So, thank you guys for listening to this episode. The third act kind of got a little Batman vs. Superman-ish. <laughs> Great way to put it. <laughs> you know, 
Because, you know, Batman vs. Superman is the fight club of the next generation. It, it is the Citizen Kane of crappy comic book movies. <laughs> no. Citizen Kane of crappy comic book movies is Deadpool. Just joking. Oh, I'm joking. I'm okay. Joking. I'm joking. Okay, we can see you next time. I'm going to kill Declan. <laughs> yeah, but the next time, guys, the, it'll probably just be James next week, either because James has killed me for some of the racist comments or comments about movies I've made. Or just, you know, me watching over 50 films and ranking them by next week. So, see you guys next time. Have a great week. And see you guys. Bye.